Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matt, 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 Matthew Dickerson. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Greetings, travelers, and welcome aboard the Tech Talk Express. Today we're bending the time space continuum, folding the next seven years into about 45 minutes of easy listening pleasure, folks. And here to guide us on our voyage of exploration, our pilot and navigator, Mr. Matthew Dickerson. How have you been, Matt? Well, I have been a pilot and navigator over the last week. I had the chance to drive to Adelaide. Now, that means nothing to many people because they don't know where I live, (laughs) but it's about 1180 kilometre trip to Adelaide. And of course, I only own EVs, so I had no choice. You what? You drove an EV all that way? Surely not. What about the range anxiety? Well, that's exactly right. I wanted to do it as a bit of a test, and I actually, you'll be very happy to know that I took accurate readings along the way. I had my logbook there ready to record everything that I did, the range that I got and what the average speed was on each leg and then how long I charged for. So I was doing it as scientifically as possible and making sure I was being very good with it. We, we should also point out th- that there are some big open spaces that you are covering as well. You're talking yeah. about places like Balranald and Hay and down through Victoria through Uyen, is that right? Uyen, Uyen, Uyen. yeah, Uyen. yeah, yeah. But, but you've got you know, that, that stretch between West Wyalong and Hay, that's a long way. Yeah, that's right. So you have got some big spots there. And so if you have got a bit of range anxiety, then that's probably not the right space to do it. Because even if you don't have a supercharger or a fast charger somewhere, you can just use a PowerPoint. But out in these areas, there's... There's not a lot of PowerPoints uh, until you get to those little... yeah. And one of the things that's always interesting, you have certainly heard people talk about this, where they talk about EVs and they say, oh no, what about when you want to drive across the Nullarbor Plain or across the, I don't know, up to Townsville or some huge distance... Most people don't do that. In fact, I don't know many people that have driven from, say, New South Wales across all the way to Perth, across the Great But you can do it, though. You can do it. People have done it. They have done it, that's right. So do you buy a car on the off chance that one day you may do that (laughs) thousands of kilometre trip, or do you say, I'll buy a car for how I use it every day, and then if I need to do a long trip, I'll see how I get around that. So what I did was I recorded very accurately what I did along that trip. The longest leg on that trip where I went between charges was 304 kilometres. So obviously I've got a car that does more than 300 kilometres. So that's Mm. fine. Not a lot more, especially when you get to the highway speeds. Most of this trip had a 110k speed limit. And I'm very good Mm. at sitting on the speed limit. I don't want to be under the speed limit. I want to go to the maximum (laughs) I can. And so I actually recorded the average speed I did on each of the legs. And on most of those legs, I was averaging anywhere from 107 down to 99 kilometres an hour. Again, you might get traffic and you might have to slow down for various things. It's hard to average 110 in a 110k zone. But so I was going along at the speeds I would normally go in a normal vehicle. And then I'd charge up at each location that I thought I needed to charge up enough to get me to the next location. So what it means was the first leg, I did about 258 kilometres. I did that in about two hours and 43 minutes. Logic would say about every two hours or so, you should have a little break. So we had a little break, and this was where people might get a bit excited, a bit hot under the collar, because my little break there at the first stop was 54 minutes. Right. Now, that's normally a bit longer than you'd have to stop to put petrol in a car. Hmm. But if I was stopping, because this is a long day to drive 1,200 kilometres, if I was stopping early in the morning to have breakfast, which I did, I'd probably spend half an hour having breakfast, maybe a little bit longer than that, go to the toilet, have breakfast, stretch your legs. It was a three-hour stretch too, which is it's a decent stretch. Yeah, that's right. So 54 minutes, I accept, is a bit longer than you'd normally need to do in a petrol car. I went along, and I won't go through every leg, but the next leg, 255 kilometres, then a 42-minute stop to charge up, maybe a bit of morning tea there. And so on it went. If I summarise the entire trip, the amount of time I spent driving, so I, I remind you, 1,179 kilometres, the amount of time I spent driving was 12 hours and 9 minutes. The amount of time I spent charging was 3 hours and 35 minutes. Now, that might be where people say, well, what a waste of time, 3 hours and 35 minutes. Mm. But keep in mind that if I drove that distance anyway, 12 hours, Mm. that's a fair drive. I'd hope that anyone driving that distance would have some stops along the way that are reasonable length stops. Not just filling up with petrol for the 5 minutes or so it takes to fill up and then keep going again and put some thumb picks or toothpicks underneath the eyelids (laughs) and keep them open. So you want to have those breaks along the way. So I accept that it took me longer to get there than if I had been driving a petrol car. Having said that, we actually arrived after a long day, we actually arrived fairly refreshed. It actually Mm. felt like when we got there, 
We weren't exhausted from a day driving because we had regular stops. I learned some things about some little places along the way because we had a little bit more time in some places. You, you'd have you take your time having a bit of afternoon tea or having a bit of lunch. You'd talk to the person. Well, if you're going to you. stop in Oyen, I believe it's the vanilla, vanilla slice capital of Australia. Well, I didn't so, find that out because oh, no. when we were at Oyen... Maybe it's old news. Well, no, it might still be right, but there was a game of AFL going on. Oh, right. So the whole town was there. Every cafe was closed. Oh, was right. closed. <laughs> the local supermarket was open, so we could still go and get something to eat there. But everything else, the main street was dead. And then I could hear some cheers... And I looked over and absolutely every car, I think, in the entire district was at the local footy ground at the time. So yeah, right. we got there at just the wrong time for that particular one. But that's the thing that happens, I suppose. If my job was to drive to Adelaide every second day, I'd probably say, well, no, an EV is not suitable for me. If my job involved me driving to Adelaide once in my lifetime so far, mm. then no, that's not right. Sorry. When we were very young, we drove across a couple of friends and I drove, time. drove across to the Adelaide Grand Prix. So I've been there twice in my lifetime in the car. So when you think about that, you go, well, you would probably survive on an EV that is fantastically useful every day. Yeah. And you just have to plan that trip a little bit ahead when you do it. So, and that's exactly what I did. I planned it, look where the charges were. And the, the really nice part about it was the total cost for that trip in my scenario, was $48. But if I had have chosen, the last charger that I charged at was a very fast charger. I only spent 19 minutes of that charger, but I paid $33 for that charger. Right beside that charger was a free charger. It was a slower charger, but I went for the fast one. But if I had have gone the slower charger, the total cost of that trip would have been $15. So Yeah, it's can, hard to match that. Can you put up with a couple of hours extra to get from A to B for the sake of, I mean, if that was a petrol car, it might have been $250, depending mm. on your car. I reckon it, it cost me 250 bucks to get from between here and Mildura. Yeah, there and, you go. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, all up. Because you've got to fill up your car before you go. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, you fill up stop once on, on, way. on your way. And then when you stop and get petrol on the way, They've got chocolates in there, and I can't help myself. Ah. So that adds to the cost as well. Yeah. <laughs> adds to the wasteland in the cost. Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting. You can do it. You can drive those long distances. So I've, I've now driven to Melbourne, Brisbane, and Adelaide in an EV and various places in between. I've driven to places like Burke. I've driven to Cobar in an EV. You can do it. Again, the only thing is you plan it, and you might take a little bit longer to get there, but that probably sounds like safe driving anyway. Hmm. Interesting. Good. Mm. All right. Well, enough of the chit chat. It's time to talk about some tops tech. When you're take, uh, talking big names about the history of computing, the names Gates and Jobs, uh, Job, it's Jobs, I think, as <laughs> you pronounce that, are probably going to hold place of prominence in the Nerds Hall of Fame. And Steve Wozniak probably should have a dedicated wall space as well. Depending on your, the depth of your nerdiness, you probably also know Alan Turing, the creator of the computer that broke the Enigma code in World War II. Maybe even Tim Berners-Lee, who was instrumental in developing the World Wide Web. But did you know about Gordon Moore? And did you know that he passed away only just recently? Matt, black armbands for everyone. But what would a truly die-hard nerd tell me about the legacy of Gordon Moore? Well, I'll talk about Gordon Moore in a moment and Moore's Law, but I want to talk about eponymous laws. Now, of Eponymous course, laws. Eponymous laws. Of course, they're not laws as in a courtroom and you're having a government hold you accountable. They're really just things when someone's been instrumental in discovering something or really furthering the information or knowledge about something, they might get a, a law, in inverted commas, named after them. So a couple of my favourites, Parkinson's Law of Triviality says that the time spent on any agenda item will be in, in, in inverse proportion to the sum of money involved. <laughs> and I do see that on committees and various things that I'm involved with where you've got something that's a very small sum of money. You can argue about that for, for a long time. If it's millions or tens of millions of dollars, it seems to be discussed in a few heartbeats and then it's all done. Move on to the next on. item. So it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Another one of my favorites, which you can get into a bit of a, a, a mind trap. It's a recursive law, a recursive, it's called Hofstadter's law. And it says that any task always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadter's law, which I love because <laughs> it just, you take into account and then it takes longer. But what if I take into account and it just, your, your mind just gets in this little oh, look, trap. I can, I can uh, yes, I can relate to that 100%. So you've got a whole range of ones, you know, Murphy's law, obviously. You've got even things like Newton's laws of motion, Ohm's law, etc. But Gordon Moore, way back in April 1965, he was writing an article for a journal. The journal was called Electronics. And he said, and I quote, 
Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits. Sorry, that's the title of his article, Mm. Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits. And in that, he said, the complexity for minimum component costs has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. Certainly over the short term, this rate can be expected to continue if not to increase. Now, essentially what he was saying was that you were getting double the number of components on a chip every so year. Double the computing power, essentially. Yeah, exactly right. Now, he did come back in 1975 and said, well, I might have been getting a bit excited about that. Maybe every two years, 18 months at best, but every, say, 18 months or two years, the computing power will double. Now, you think 1965, mm. move that forward to 1975, that's probably sure, early days of computing, that's going to be all a bit irrelevant a few years after that. Now, mm. Gordon Moore did go on to help found Intel. About 1968, he was a co-founder of Intel, so a huge chip manufacturer, instrumental in a whole range of things that have happened in electronics. But Moore's law, as it was it came to be known, has been holding true yeah, right. till today. If you graph out computing power or the the number of circuits or the number of semiconductors on a chip, then you find that roughly it's doubling about that rate every two years. Yeah. So it's still going. Now, but logic says you can't... It's got to reach a ceiling. Surely. If you, you can't have something doubling forever. That You can have something increasing a bit forever, but doubling forever exponential things like that, you have to get to the stage where you reach a ceiling. Well, now, you actually, yeah, if you understand uh, what a PNP uh, junction is in semiconductors, they can only get to be so small before they become ineffective. So you need uh, a PNP, or a, I think you can have NPN as well. I'd have to go back and check my, my notes. But, um, yeah, the, they can because electrons need a certain a gap uh, to jump, if the gap becomes too small, there's just... Yeah, there's no effect. The effect that they need is redundant. Yeah, that's right. And you do start to get to the stage where when the transistors on a chip approach the atomic scale, yeah. which is, we're not quite sure we're there yet, but we're getting close to that, then obviously it becomes much harder to keep developing at the same rate. So far be it for me to contradict Moore's law, but surely we're getting to the stage now where we just can't keep doubling that computing We're moving power. now into, hopefully, quantum computing. Which so might that's, be a whole new that's paradigm. Um, that's right. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks to the people at New South Wales Uni who are working hard on that. Yeah. yeah so, so fascinating there. So, yes, the, the whole reason for this is that Gordon Moore has died. Now, Gordon didn't, when he quoted that law, or when he, when he quoted that in that article, he didn't make it happen. It's a bit like... Newton saw an apple fall from a tree Mm. and that didn't suddenly create gravity. Gravity was always there. His observation and then the work he did after that helped explain it. And I think what Moore's law did in my mind is it didn't say that that allowed things to happen, but it probably gave people confidence in where computing was going. Mm. And as they saw that happen more and more, excuse the very bad pun there, then, (laughs) then we probably had people put more confidence, put more investment into the whole IT sector. And I know back when we used to be planning servers for clients and and designing their computer networks, we used to say to them, in three years' time, you'll need to replace this because not just the computing power, but the amount of storage space, Mm. the amount of RAM, a whole range of things on that computer will be at the stage where there'll be a quarter of what you can get now. So it'll double in, say, 18 months and double again. And so in three years' time, and, and clients are like, no, this, I've spent that much money on this server. It'll do me forever. Mm. And three years' time, you'll be talking to them saying, well, look, actually, what you can get now for the same cost as what you spent three years ago is now quadruple everything that was there. Yeah. So it wasn't just about computing power. It was in so many parts of computing. So, yeah, quite fascinating, quite interesting. Um, you know, RIP Gordon Moore, a true pioneer mm. in computing. And uh, Moore's Law will live on for... Many years to come yet, who knows? Now, we've ascertained in previous episodes that commercial electric flight is very much a pipe dream at this stage. Batteries for flying are just going to be way too heavy. Or are they? Don't write off electric flight full stop, folks. No, sorry. Electric planes not only can happen, but they are happening and they are apparently excellent for pilot training, as one flying school in Victoria will attest. Matt, electric planes have gotten these guys all a buzz. Am I right? They have. They're using them in the real world, and that's what I love about this. Yeah. We have talked about some things That'll happening. That'll never work. You'll never do that. <laughs> that's right. And when we talk about things that are coming up, things that are being planned, designed, 
we think that some of those might happen in a few years' time. But right now, if you're in Victoria and you want to go and learn how to fly, you can go to a flight school where they have electric two-seater aircraft and they're absolutely perfect for pilot training because they're so cheap to run. Mm. They're running at about 10% of the cost of a normal internal combustion aircraft. They're designed specifically for pilot training. I mean, two people on there, obviously, you're not really going to use it for carrying passengers because you've only got one passenger you can carry. There's no luggage. No luggage there, that's right. And they're quite a nice little plane. When I looked at the picture of one, they look like a quite nice little plane, but you can get, obviously, all the training you need in. And think about it with training, what you're mainly doing is you're taking off, flying a bit, landing, taking off, landing, you're doing a lot of takeoff and landings. Mm. You're probably not just going up and turning on autopilot for an hour and saying, well, gee, I, I spent an hour flying today, isn't that great? So this particular plane has got about an hour's worth of flight time. So for most training, I'd imagine, you're probably not going up and spending hours in the air. You're going up and down, up and down. And then they've done that and they move that passenger on or that pilot trainee on and they move the next one in while it's charging up. They get their paperwork done and off they go. So it makes a lot of sense to me. But once we get to the stage where people are learning to fly in electric aircraft and people are seeing them in the air Mm. and then they're realising how quiet they are and how efficient they are, then surely those pilots are going to go and start working in some commercial airliners and saying, what are you doing with these internal combustion engines? Where are your electric Mm. planes? Why aren't I flying an electric plane? So that'll actually progress, I think, the whole industry quite quickly. Well, also, the more use that these electric planes get, the more tinkering that uh, engineers can do to just refine, tweak things to be a little bit more efficient. Um, We see a whole industry develop there. Yeah, that's right. And I think we've talked about it before. They're probably a long way away from Sydney to LA flights, mm. from New York to London. You just don't have the battery flights. technology. That's right. And it may well be that hydrogen or ammonia or something else is used for some of those flights or yeah. maybe jet fuel for a fair while to come. But we think the real sweet spot for electric aircraft will be those commuter flights, uh, one and a half hours, mm. around that sort of time frame or less. That's where you'll find the real cost effectiveness of electric aircraft. And that's where they'll be able to have enough batteries on there to be able to get them that one and a half hour. So mm. quite interesting. But right now, yeah, if you want to go and fly, if you want to learn to fly, presumably if it's one tenth the cost to run it, that means your pilot training is cheaper as well. Mm. Hopefully the, the costs are passed on to the pilot or the trainee pilot. Therefore, it might be easier to get pilot licences, uh, there might be more pilots out there You may there see well. a whole lot more personal aircraft as well being used uh, around well, the place too. Yeah, a, a lot more too. air traffic just with uh, people just um, jumping that, that hour distance. Um, While you still need pilots, that's right, until they yeah. become drones. Or drones. <laughs> <laughs> In 2023, the term smart can be found prefixing almost any otherwise inanimate object. That is to say that if you're in the manufacturing business and you haven't yet inserted some sort of electrical silicon chip or electrified silicon chip, I should say, into your thing, then someone else is going to do it very, very soon. And you're about to become a redundant relic of yesteryear. Bandage makers, your time is up. The first smart bandage is out, and the rest of you can tell your story walking. Matt Sp- Smart Bandages, he says with a question mark at the end of that, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have talked about it before, haven't we, that you just put the word smart yep. in front of anything, and then and it's... Um, stick a chip in it. <laughs> that's right, and everything's fantastic. But it's, we're, it's Smart band. It's not gonna. it's not going to address the wound itself. Well, almost. It's going to do some interesting things. They're only testing in mice and rats at the moment, but... The idea is that you've got sticking plaster, but in that sticking plaster, you've got a flexible printed circuit board, and that's got some electrochemical sensors built into it, and they monitor things like the temperature of the wound, the pH of the wound, to work out how well it's healing, and then it can actually use, inside the bandage, it's got some little peptides there. So if it realises that it needs some extra... Motivation to heal? Shut the front door. <laughs> it's got a little bit of zing to get the helper to heal a little bit faster. Exactly right. So you can monitor on your phone. You can because one of the things when you stick a band aid over a wound, you want to look underneath. You've got to take a peek every That's now. That's right. Oh, how's it healing? <laughs> well, no, I should just leave the band aid. No, I want to look underneath it. This way, you can actually have a virtual look underneath it by going to your phone, looking at your phone, looking at those markers to see how well it's wow. healing. But then automatically, that bandage can say, oh, you know what. 
we've got two little electrodes in here. They can just release small amounts of the drugs that might be needed to help this healing progress. So one would assume, yeah, to move it along a little bit faster. So for, for, I can imagine there's all sorts of scenarios where you might need that wound to heal a little bit faster than normal. Well, any time it sounds like it makes sense. But you've also got on top of some drugs that can be delivered, a little bit of electrostimulation as well. Ah, get those (laughs) cells waking up and healing just that little bit faster. So you might feel a bit of a buzz in your little wound that you've got there. (laughs) How far away are we? before you just go into your local pharmacy and buy a packet of these and that's what you stick on when your son falls over and skins his knee and you just stick this Band-Aid on yeah. and then say, there you go, I'll monitor on your app to see how it's going. Purochrome is a thing of the past. It's probably got <laughs> some disinfectant there, some, some antiseptic, I should say, not disinfectant. Well, there's no reason they couldn't do that as well. So you could have it all, sterile, all sorts yeah. of things there. So I think we're a few years away from picking them off the pharmacy shelf. I imagine they'd be used in medical facilities first, you're in hmm. a hospital, you're, you're going to see a doctor, you might get this extra treatment by going to see your doctor, but surely it gets to a point where someone says, if we sell Cheaper a technology. thousand of these, I can make so much money. If I sell a million of these, I can make more money, so let's go for the million. But it does sound fascinating, and that comes down to the ability to create printed circuit boards that are small and flexible. That's <laughs> the real breakthrough in this particular one. Obviously, there's a battery on board as well, but again, battery technology has progressed. A tiny battery all built in, and the bandage that I looked at in, when I was watching or, or doing the research for this, it looked like just a normal bandage that was a bit thicker than a normal bandage. You didn't wow. really notice that it had things hanging off it everywhere. And and again, it's obviously got Bluetooth and everything goes better with Bluetooth. So. <laughs> These days, people, if you can't make something by 3D printing it, then you're probably working too hard. But what about a cheesecake? I hear you scream through the speakers. I love cheesecake, and you'll never 3D print a cheesecake. Well, folks, that may have been in 2022, you Luddites. But this is 2023, and we now live in a world where 3D printing cheesecakes is a thing, and almost anything is possible with a 3D printer. Matt, I'm a smidge peckish for a tasty techno dessert. What are my options here? Well, I haven't got one here, I'm sorry. So oh, you, no. You have to get one the old-fashioned way. But we have talked about it before. You've only got, we had the discussion about exactly how many naturally occurring elements, 92-ish. That's right. Thereabouts. Just and mix so, them together and spit them out in the right order. Exactly right. Now, I'm not saying that this particular 3D printer has got 92 elements loaded in. They've only got seven ingredients. So basically, you put seven ingredients into this 3D printer and you can print a variety of foods. Now, Thermomixes except, are going to be a thing of the past. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> My wife loves a Thermomix. But you've got, in this particular one, the seven ingredients, you've got crackers, peanut butter, strawberry jam, Nutella, banana puree, cherry syrup, and frosting. So you've got those seven ingredients loaded into this particular 3D printer. And then you say, 3D print me some cheesecake. Now, the interesting <laughs> part was that the first examples that I looked at were cheesecake, but it didn't look that attractive. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit so of a you're floppy. prepared to wear the blindfold? <laughs> well, I think you're right. If you had uh, someone blindfolded and they had normal cheesecake and this, you'd put it on a spoon and taste it. You go, oh, it tastes fantastic. But it just didn't look right. And I think then the appeal, So it doesn't come out as a, a homogeneous sort of blob of all the same look? It kind of was. Oh, the, and right. that was the first one. So that was in the experimentation. And I looked at the process of this over a, a number of experiments in terms of trying to get it right. So all the ingredients were there, but it just didn't stand up. So they found they kept changing some of the actual mixtures and got to the stage where they increased the cracker portion from 32% to 70%. And then improved the structural support for the cheesecake. Ah. And lo and behold, (laughs) they then had a cheesecake that came out. And just to top it all off, it had a little laser beam to lightly brown the top of it just to give it that perfect look. And once they got that right, (laughs) you had the cheesecake come out and you looked at it and you went, that's a cheesecake. That looks just the same as the cheesecake that I go into the Cheesecake Factory and buy off the shelf. And it tastes the same because guess what? It's got all the same stuff that's in the cheesecake as you would normally buy a cheesecake. How far away are we from printing vegetables? A long Mm. way. I'm just not sure that we've got that technology yet. But when we talk about processed foods, let's face it, they're processed foods. So you can take those processed foods and mix them together. As long as you mix them together in the right way in some sort of 3D printer, then you're probably going to get 
a processed food. Well, any any sort of food is just a mixture of protein and lipid and carbohydrate and, uh, and these essentially organic molecules. If you can organise those, why can't you print yourself an apple? Well, I think you're right, theoretically, but I just don't know yeah, how close they still we are. Got to, they've still got to be able to do it. That's right. Whereas with things like this that are processed, so if you've got sticky date pudding, if you've mm. got banana cake, if you've got chocolate cake, whatever, cheesecake, I can see that they're much easier to do because you are taking processed foods anyway and mixing them together. So that makes sense to me. Again, getting fruits and vegetables, wow, that'd be fantastic. Imagine some of the people starving around the world that we mm. could produce foods for. Apologies to any farmers out there at the moment listening in. But, but I'm thinking about a mission to Mars. You've got a six-month trip. It's so much easier just to pack all that, that protein into a, a, a tightly – so you'll pack it without any airspace at all, yep. and you can be printing yourself cheesecake all the way to Mars. <laughs> That's right. 18 months ago, is it a six-month trip? Turn yeah. up 50 kilos heavier than when you left. <laughs> <laughs> so it is fascinating, 3D printing. We talk about 3D printing a bit with different things you can print, but 3D printing food, wow, that's, that's next level, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We all get touched with anxiety every now and then, and for some people... Common situations that would otherwise be part of normal life bring tension and nausea at the mere thought. Managing mental health has become a boom, in, boom industry in the 2020s, and that's clearly not a good thing. But solutions for people managing conditions like anxiety often require creative measures, and there, there lies an option for some technological initiative. Matt, what clever tech options are available for people managing anxiety in 2023? And let's talk about non-drug techniques to manage anxiety. That sounds yeah. like a good thing. And I thought about when I've seen my kids, for example, sit on the couch and the dog jumps up on the couch and they sit there and they're just patting the dog gently and very soothing and the dog looks very relaxed and my child looks very relaxed while they're well, doing that. We know that pets as therapy is a, is a very, very powerful tool. And I don't know whether it's the connection with the pet or just the, the feel of the, the touch there. I don't know enough about psychology to know what might be happening there, but these particular researchers at Cornell University said maybe there's something about the touch. So they well, it's built, a whole fluffy toy, plush toy industry, isn't it? Yeah, it, that's exactly it. It's so they the built of the touch. a nice little armband, and on the end of the armband, it's got a nice little synthetic fur patch, and that synthetic fur patch just strokes your arm back and forth, nice and soothing, not too fast, just a nice, soothing, calm stroke. Right. Now, then they took a group of participants and put them through some tests that were designed to create anxiety, create some sort of anxiousness, and had this armband on and had the armband off, obviously did it with a range of different groups of people, and found that certainly having this was some impact. Now... You obviously, it's hard to go for a placebo effect here because you mm. know it's there. It's, yeah. it's not like you can say, I'm not telling you whether you're having your arm stroked by a. Can't a do bit a double blind first. test on this one. It's a bit of a tough one, isn't it? But they did find that they measured, for example, things like heart rate variability, heart rate. Uh, so just to see whether or not there was stress being created, whether people were getting anxious. And then they had a six question survey, which kind of put them under stress because you had to finish this survey, you had to finish these questions and then monitor those things around their heart rate and their variability, et cetera, to see how it impacted them. And the people having the little bit of synthetic fur stroking their arm actually found that it was better for their anxiety. Now, anxiety and stress are a little bit different, so they tried mm. to measure stress and anxiety. They found that it didn't necessarily reduce stress but it did reduce anxiety. Now, I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not sure how I'd define the difference between anxiety and stress. Well, I think um, in positions of anxiety, your ability to deal with stress, stress would be diminished. Quite yeah. Possibly, yeah. And so anxiety um, stops you from being able to function normally, and stress is a normal function of a normal part of our life. And maybe that's exactly what happened. The body was still under stress because it was doing something difficult, it was answering questions, but it's whether you become anxious from that or not. So mm. they actually found that it reduced levels of anxiety. Now, where is this going to be used? I can imagine that a fair bit more research, some more data, some more analysis, but it might get to the stage where it's used in situations where people might be anxious and eventually there are so many home products now, it'll be a product that you'll buy off the shelf 
at your local white goods retailer and you can sit at home and watching your team lose in a football <laughs> match might be a good enough reason to well, bring up the arm. Further than that even, and, and um, we've known for a long time that um, uh, mental health is going to, uh, was going to affect teenagers in a big way and I see um, anxiety as a big thing in classrooms. Right. So just having one of these things attached to your arm, your arm while you're sitting in class could be very therapeutic, I think. And if you're worried about people staring at you funny with this, it's the, the one that I saw was a little bit bulky, but I imagine it would get to the stage where it's small enough you could just have it underneath your sleeve. So you wouldn't even exactly. know. Yeah. You're feeling a bit anxious, you just flick a switch and away you go. It just sits there and you just feel a bit calmer mm. while you're doing it. Who knows if it'll work as well on your ankle, for example, as it does on your wrist, but I imagine there's probably more sensitivity we know that yeah the, the wrist has got a lot of sensitivity you know, a lot of those uh, what are the pressure receptors in the um, in the skin there yeah um, yeah there's got to be other pressure points as well yeah quite um, possibly. around the body but again I, I think if you could do it without people knowing about it that might create some stress on itself by having people look at you and go, oh, you've got that funny arm thing on, James. What are you doing? Yeah. But again, have it under your sleeve and I can see sorts, all it's sorts of situations. Yeah, mm. Fascinating. Police in the US have been employing AI quite a bit recently for facial recognition. And it's proving to be quite effective. But there's a minor speed bump, however. The company Clearview, who developed the software and gathered a heap of data there, don't actually have permission to use people's faces. Matt, therein lies a reasonably hefty breach of the Privacy Act, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, they've been, Clearview's been in trouble, actually, in Europe and Australia for privacy breaches. They've scoured 30 billion images from the internet so far. Yeah, right. So it's just people walking past the shop front or whatever. Or and posting on their social media. Uh, yeah, or right. Any, okay. Any image they can get, as long as they can identify. Bang, 30 billion, because there's not 30 billion people on the planet. That's right. So they've got multiple versions of you, side on, front on, wow. above, below, all sorts of different images. As long as their technology can scrape an image of you and know it's you, it goes into the database. James Eddy, there's his picture. James Eddy, there's another picture. With all that information, then some organisations like law enforcement, for example, might say to Clearview, gee, we've got this image of this person. Yeah. Can you just tell us who it is? Now, in the US, and Miami police, for example, said they've used it about 450 times over the last year. The big concern, well, privacy for a start, mm. but then how accurate is it? Now, Miami police have said... We'll use it as a lead generation tool. We see a photo of someone who might be involved in a crime. We set a clear view. Who's this? They give us back the answer. We go and knock on their door and say, where were you on the mm. night of the 17th or whatever it might have been? So they're using it in that lead generation. But are we at the point where someone's going to try and use it in a courtroom and show an image of someone? Yeah. Here's clear view. <laughs> That's saying quite clearly that it's you, James, and you're saying, but I was over visiting my brother in Istanbul, yeah. and how could I possibly have been there? doesn't matter. We've got the image here, and that's definitely you, according to Clearview. It just goes to show what is happening behind the scenes that we don't know about, yeah. and the amount of data, the amount of information that's being collected on every human being out there at the moment. And if you try to get to the point where you don't have your photo out there somewhere, hey, good luck with that because it's near impossible. Yeah, not I'd be interested to know if there's anyone who still doesn't have their photo somewhere. Somewhere, that's right. No no linkage to a photo and your name somewhere out there. I mean, people would try and not have it You'd there, have but, to be but like it could just be as simple as your driver's license. Someone hacks the bingo. database for those and then they've got it. So you might think, I'm really good. No one can take my photo. I don't have my photo on social media. But there are official government places, passports, driver's licenses, where there might be photos there, and they sometimes get hacked. We know that. So, yeah, good luck if you think you haven't got it there. But committing a crime and expecting to get away with it, well, you probably it's probably getting harder and harder. The big concern, obviously, is people being wrongly accused. That's one thing, wrongly convicted of a crime mm. based on this. And I hope the police are still going through their normal processes. So in the US, they're using Clearview. In Australia and Europe, we're finding them. So it's a, it's a bit of a different scenario. <laughs> the prediction for self-driving cars is that some stage in the indefinite future, driving will not only be far safer for the passengers, but it'll also be substantially different, uh, will improve uh, traffic conditions substantially and your travel times, particularly in high-density traffic 
situations in the big city. That's probably still some time away yet, though, but we are moving one step closer with the development of tech to help driverless cars to see the unseeable. Matt, what is this tricky tech all about? I'm going to use the word x-ray again. We see this thrown it around. Three weeks in a row. That's right. Bang. What the heck? Let's call this one x-ray as well. It's not really, but it sounds sexy, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. X-ray vision for cars. Well, I want one of those. Now, one of the things that's fascinating in big cities is we've got lots of cameras. Mm. We've got cameras that are at many traffic lights. In fact, just about every set of traffic lights has got some cameras there, detect speeding, detect red light, people running through red lights. You've got other cameras that are owned by the city, the government, in various other situations, detecting speeding, a whole range of things. Imagine if a car that was driving along could access information from those cameras to decide whether or not they should go a certain route or not because they know what the traffic is like. So they're driving and three blocks away where the cameras on that car, thinking autonomous cars here in particular, but cameras mm. on that car can see a certain distance, but they can't see three blocks away. They haven't got X-ray vision. But if they could just tap into those other cameras and decide not to turn left at the next intersection because they know there's a big build-up of cars two blocks down the track, keep going a couple of blocks further and take a different route because there's not as much traffic that way. And that's exactly what they're doing at the moment. The University of Nottingham is working with a whole range of companies, some car companies, Nissan, you've got Transport Research Laboratory, a whole range of different organisations where that's exactly what they're doing. Now, it doesn't mean that you can drive along in your car and pull up on your centre console what those other cameras are seeing. Obviously, some privacy issues there. But the actual cameras themselves are feeding data in just to talk about traffic congestion. And then with that information, feeding that to the car yeah, to say so car which streets... Yeah, decisions. Yeah, that's right, which streets are less congested. Now, we do a little bit of this already with metadata. So when you pull up something like Google Maps, you'll see different colours on the map if you're yeah. working how to get from A to B. And that's basing that on metadata to say there are phones travelling along this route at the moment. But if you've got a build-up of traffic... It's pretty hard for metadata to work out whether those phones are in cars going at walking speed or people on the footpath going at walking speed. (laughs) Actually walking. So that makes it a bit harder. You get an idea. Yes, there are more mobile phones in that area than we might expect there to be, but we're not quite sure what they're made up of. And we're not really sure which direction they're going in. Yes, we can work out a bit of that through which the the phones are obviously traveling one direction. But when we see that on a map, it's just congestion. There's a bit of congestion there. Mm. This is basically next level of that. So looking at the traffic, specifically looking at the cars on the road, making decisions on that, feeding that back into the car, and then redirecting you via your satellite navigation. Or if it's autonomous, it'll just make decisions for you. So you're sitting in the car. Oh, gee, I don't know why we we turned left last week. I'm sure we went down that street. I don't know why we didn't go down that street this time. And then, of course, you turn left in two streets or two blocks later, and you think, oh, it must have been a different route this time. So it would be constantly monitoring all that traffic, making decisions. We're a long way from actually using this yet. Mm. Research, very early stages, but it just gives you an idea of the way people are thinking about this sort of stuff. The way well, I actually th- thought as well that um, with autonomous cars, there would be the option for cars to actually talk with each other. So you'd be talking with cars that are three blocks away yep. and you'll be predicting what's going to be able to happen there uh, and that so these well this means everyone's got to be <laughs> driving autonomous cars though well you're right but you, you're spot on and that's a couple of levels away because you have to have all these cars if not autonomous at least be connected to the outside world yeah. and it probably takes 20 years before you're replacing the majority of cars on the road at the moment. So this would allow you to start to make those decisions before you get to that point, which is the ultimate aim, where all the cars are just talking to each other. Slow down, there's a traffic engine. What are you doing, braking? What are you What are you so close to me for? Move back a bit. Mm. All those sort of conversations can go on amongst the cars. Oh, there's a kangaroo jumped out. I've seen on my brakes, so every car behind slams on their brakes. Uh, that all sounds fantastic, but... We've got to get everyone... We're just trying to get people to change EVs, James. We've got a long way to go before you get... <laughs> One step at a time. One yeah. step at a time. charger in my car is awesome and I love it. It's fast and convenient and makes our other car feel like the Flintstone mobile with cords dangling carelessly all over the centre console. So the good people at Tesla have decided that this sort of tech should be available everywhere and you can now pick up for yourself a portable Tesla wireless charging platform 
for your daily convenience. Matt, is it time for my family to start their Christmas shopping already? Absolutely. (laughs) Sounds great. Now, one of the things I love about this is that Apple made a big announcement several years ago. I can't actually remember when, but it was was many years ago, about a device called AirPower. Hmm. You've got a wireless charger on your phone. You've got wireless charger on your AirPods. You've got wireless charging on your watch. What an inconvenience having a variety of wireless chargers, and getting it just in the right spot. Hmm. So they announced at one of their mega launches, AirPower, and they showed off AirPower in operation with a little asterisk beside it to say, not yet available, but it was going to be available soon. And you can imagine there was a fair bit of hype in the market. What a great platform. You can just put all these different devices on it. You don't care where you put them. You just sit it on there somewhere, and it just starts charging. Great, great things, Apple. Fantastic. And we kept waiting. And there kept being some commentary, and Apple was always coming out, and it was coming. And then finally, very quietly, Apple just removed any further announcements about ah. AirPower because they couldn't <laughs> get it to work. Tesla said, well, Apple Challenge didn't get to work. That's exactly right. We are going to get this thing to work. So they built a platform, a wireless charging platform. It's got 30 overlapping coils in four layers just to give you the convenience to drop your phone on there, wherever Where you, you feel want. like. That's right. If it can sit on there, <laughs> on the pad somewhere, it can charge. So it works with your phone. It works with various wireless buds. So if you've got Samsung or you've got Apple buds, the charging case on those, if they're wireless, it'll work with those. It doesn't work with an Apple Watch. That is somewhat different in terms of the charging on that. So it's just ever so slightly different. But any of those standard wireless devices, it will work with. It can have multiple on there at the same time. That's pretty cool. That's very cool. Having... A normal wireless charger, it's got one charging coil, you line it up nicely, and it charges one-to-one. Fantastic. But this, as I said, it's got 30 different coils. You just sit on there anywhere and have multiple ones. So very clever technology there. And I imagine that Tim Cook at Apple is going, damn you, Tesla. (laughs) You've done what we said we were going to do, and we couldn't just get it right. I haven't used one yet, so I can't tell you how well it works. But presumably they've got it working, they've tested it, and they've got it out in the on the market, so it must work. So yes, tell your kids to buy this for you for Christmas. What the heck? Buy it for you for Easter if you want, whatever. <laughs> you can't wait till Christmas for these things. So, so it's a good idea. It was a good idea when Apple announced it, but again, they just couldn't quite get it right. So good on you, Tesla. Telstra and the Commonwealth Bank uh, have teamed up to try to save Australians millions of dollars from being frauded by scams. Matt, how's this going to work? Well, it's actually good to see the two logical companies or two logical industries getting together to try and stop scammers. They're normally making a phone call or sending a text message to you, maybe an email. So it's some sort of communication. So telcos are involved in the scamming process. I'm not saying they're doing the scamming, but mm. they're obviously an important part for a scammer to use. And then obviously they rely on your bank account. They want to take some money from your bank account. So they've now, Telstra and the CBA have now said, we should work out some way that we can team up to maybe put a bit of a red flag, notify a customer, maybe let them know that something is happening that maybe not is, or maybe not is what that person wants to happen. So for example, if you're on a call and a large transfer is about to happen out of your CBA account, then it'll be paused and you'll be notified about that. So if you just want right. to go and transfer, you're going and paying for a, a, a new fridge or a furniture or whatever, and you're going to transfer $10,000, it's fine. It just transfers as it normally would. But if you were about to do that while you happen to be on a call, the technology behind the scenes is smart enough to say, yeah, right. Telstra and Commonwealth Bank, let's talk to each other and just pause that transaction and tell the customer that it looks like they're doing a transaction that's a large transaction. Do you mean to do this at the moment? And so then you can say, oh, yeah, I'm on the phone to my white goods retailer and I'm just about to go and buy that large product, so it's all okay. Or, oh, actually, you think this isn't legitimate? You think that something's wrong here? Okay, let's just pause on that a little bit. So you might then block that transaction. You might then say it's okay. But the most important part is delay that transaction to begin with and then see you go. Now, this is only Telstra and the CBA. Obviously, as we go forward, if this works and works the way they want it to work, then... You'll probably see a whole lot more partnerships striking up. That's right. Now, it, it would be great to see the government eventually come to the stage and say, all telcos and all banking institutions must discuss this process and come up with a common protocol that means that this is going to be across the board. At the moment, you're relying on a couple of companies doing it themselves. The other one, I think, 
that's really important is name check. So when you transfer money, I can transfer money to you with your BSB and your account number, and I can put Wobble Doobble as your name. There's yeah. no check to make sure that it's legitimate, the name that it's going to. Yeah, I wonder sometimes why we even do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Makes us feel a bit better. What's the name on your account, James? Yeah. I'm never going to use it in any transaction, but it makes you feel better when you give me your name. And name check is something that, again, I think needs to get to that point where it's standard for the transaction to work. It's mm. not just the BSB and the account number. We want to see a name on that transaction as well. Otherwise, well you've always got something wrong there or you're pretending to be a different company because then when you go to a bank and open a bank account and say, I want to be called ABC for Products Limited, hold on, that's not your company name. Mm. Yeah, I want to do that because I want to scam people and think they're transferring money to ABC Products Limited, then sometimes some red flags might go off there. So it's good to see different organisations getting together. That's not perfect. If you were talking on WhatsApp, for example, Telstra doesn't know about that. WhatsApp is using data, but it's not a phone call as mm. such. So you might get other ways they try and get around it, but at least we're trying to take steps using technology, not relying on you and I telling everyone, hey, everyone, be careful, it might be a scam, using back-end technology to try and stop it. Where it goes, I'm not sure. We've said it before, can't people just be nice? Yeah. That'd be easier. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see if this works, and, and it's one extra step in, in defending us from you know, being swindled out of our cash. You're exactly right. Hit the nail on the head. And I'm chalking uh, that up one. Oh, that up one. That one up as a good news story, which is a positive note to finish on, just like this one. And that's all we have time for, folks. Thanks for another cracking tech talk, Matt. So when you say you know, you're finishing on, what note was that? Was that just one note or was that a, a range of notes? <laughs> I thought it was all right. I thought it was sweet. It felt like a good note. Right, good. And which note was it? Yes, it <laughs> was a note. Good, good. So now let me just mention one other thing that I didn't mention at the very beginning of the episode. When I talked about driving, one of the things that I really wanted to say at the beginning was speed is so important when you're driving. Mm. So when you are driving at 110 k's an hour, you're using about 21% more power than when you're driving at 100 k's an hour. You're using 49% more power than when you're driving at 90 mm. k's an hour. So right. keep that in mind when you are doing those longer trips, if you are driving an EV, or if you're driving a petrol car, it's all the same, using more petrol. So that's where highway ranges can be dramatically different to around the town ranges. So keep that in mind for those long EV trips. It might help with that range anxiety. Absolutely. Excellent footnote there. Thanks, Matt. Me? Well, I'm pretty peckish now for a piece of cheesecake, so I'm off to find a 3D printer that'll do the job for me. And maybe if I can see the printout, maybe a roast lamb and baked spuds for dinner too, perhaps. Thanks for tuning in once again, folks. As always, it's a pleasure to bring you the latest news of the world of technology, and we look forward to doing it again next week. I'm your host, James Eddy, and we'll catch up with you again next time for another freshly wrapped Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Have a great week. 